because uh, uh, again, welcome everyone. <laughs> it's good to be together. And, uh, <laughs> but uh, there, there's, uh, you know, a path that we're on in our followership of Jesus and in this, this walking together with him uh, by the power of the spirit, the equipping of the spirit that uh, is really more like, as the Celts put it, uh, a circular dance, a wandering, where if you looked at it from a bird's eye view, it would look more like a dance, <laughs> you know, coming over uh, familiar terrain and yet seeing it with new eyes, experiencing the Holy Spirit in it, uh, then it would look like simply a linear journey. And so this, this wandering we're on together is through the scriptures, um, exploring the, the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. So uh, as I shared this morning, uh, this, this uh, time together really uh, emerged for me out of an invitation to, uh, in a sense, take everything that I've, I've learned walking with the Holy Spirit or studying the Holy Spirit, uh, preaching on the work of the Holy Spirit, uh, participating with the Holy Spirit in different ways. Uh, someone invited me to uh, do a 70-day journey daily devotional writing, exploring uh, the Holy Spirit through the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation. And one of the delights for me, though there were, there were some challenging moments in it, was uh, not only the rediscovery of ideas that I've, I've reflected on before related to the Holy Spirit, but honestly, moments where I would chip away at something and all of a sudden, uh, there would be, uh, I, I said this morning, I'm, um, my mother's from a long line of coal miners, so I love mining analogies. Um, you know, you're just chipping away at this thin vein and all of a sudden you realize you've hit a mother load and there's a bit of an awakening in your heart. You're saying, Lord, there's more for us. There's more for me. And, uh, and I would love to just yield to you in a new way so that my, my later years, I'm at 57 now, would be richer and fuller with uh, communing with you, Holy Spirit, than even my, my previous years. And, uh, and it's like in marriage, um, I, I tell my wife, there's, there's a deep friendship that God intends. Um, marriage is hard, no matter what, how you slice it. But there's a deep friendship that only lives on the other side of tremendous suffering, has been my experience. Um, and facing tremendous challenges and, and wearing through it. And, and I found that it's similar in intimacy with God uh, through our lifetime, that all the same tools are there. Some new, new tools come along the way to help us uh, grow and nurture intimacy with the Holy Spirit. But there is a deepening that the Lord does uh, that um, I think will lead us across the line into the fullness of, of his presence. Uh, many years ago, my uh, grandfather, who had heart disease, when I was uh, a teenager in my late teens, he had come to faith later in life. And I had just recently come to faith as a became a Christian in my high school years. And uh, he lived a few blocks from our house. And I would sit with him on our front porch on this old front porch swing. And he was on an oxygen tank at the time. His heart was failing him. And all he could have for liquids were, were little chips of ice. And we would sit on this front porch swing, this, my grandfather and uh, his, his teenage grandson, and he would just share wisdom with me about life, what he had learned, uh, what God was teaching him now after he had become a, a believer uh, years before. And he would just share with me things like, you know, um, you know, love often turns from wow, 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 to bow, wow, wow, he would say to me. <laughs> and I was going, what, what does that even mean? But I'm sure in the 40s, that really made a lot of sense. And, but I got it. I got what he was saying, you know, <laughs> something so beautiful and pristine can get hard and dark, you know, <laughs> and difficult. And, uh, and he would share this, this wisdom with me. But uh, on his deathbed, he was uh, taken home. We set up uh, our, his house just down, you know, a few blocks from us to be uh, the place where he would live out his final days. And he was on a bed there and there was a full-time nurse giving him care. And as his heart was failing him, we'd see him go in and out of consciousness and uh, in and out of the states of, of clear reasoning and then delirium, it seemed to be. And one particular morning, it was the morning of the day he died, I was sitting on his bedside 
uh, my grandfather, my mentor, my intercessor, which is uh, to this day, you know, grandmas and grandpas are just dangerous when it comes to getting getting a hold of prayer and what it means in their 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 uh, you know uh, their grandchildren's lives. But I was sitting at his bedside and I was holding his hand and it was so thin and so frail. He was a, a you know a big strong man and was in the military and and you know he he always felt like he was a tower of strength and calmed me. And in this moment, you know, I just was holding his hand. It was so frail and so cold. And I'm sitting at his bedside in what was was then their living room that had been uh, transformed into this this bedroom, this nursing care space, uh, which was a very you know strange thing for me to have all our Christmases and other experiences transformed into this bedroom hospital now, uh, this space and. And we were talking and, and most of the time I was talking and he was just listening. And then he went into one of his states of delirium and, uh, and he began to cry out for his mother. And then he just began to say the names like he was crying out to old army buddies and friends. And he was in another world and I was just holding his hand and I, I didn't really know what to do at that age. I just had no, you know, uh, no uh, sense of, of, of how I could help. And I felt so helpless. And as he was crying out to his, his mother, he stopped and he gripped my hand as tightly as I had ever felt him grip it. And he looked me in the eye, sat up, leaned up in bed. And he said, Daniel, enjoy your life. Jesus will take care of you. I love you. I love you. I love you. And he faded back into his delirium. Well, what my grandfather didn't realize, or maybe he did in that moment is he left a legacy in me. He just left a legacy and the Holy Spirit just imprinted me with a sense of awareness of his love and my grandfather's love for me and the Lord's love for me. And he got up, uh, excuse me, he didn't, he didn't get up. What I meant is I got up, I left. And an hour later, I got the call, the ambulance came and my grandfather had been taken, and just a, a few minutes down the road, he passed away in the ambulance. The story isn't over yet, though. I think it was two days later, a friend of mine gave me a call. He was a paramedic, and he was just a little bit older than me. And he said, Dan, I've been just holding something. I'm just, I was just struggling to tell you, um, and I don't know why, but I want to tell you, I was with your grandpa in that ambulance on the way out from his house. And he said, and he was in a state of delirium. And I said, yep, I, I knew that I experienced that. And he said, but, but here's what I want to tell you. He said, we were just a few minutes down the road and he was in the state of delirium and he stopped and he lifted his hands up and he looked at the, the ceiling of the ambulance as he was laying there and he smiled and he said, Jesus, I see you. I'm coming. And he dropped his head back and died. And he said, I just needed you to know that happened. And I think he was just so freaked out by it because of where he was at. He didn't know what to do with it. <laughs> but he told me that. And, and I remember, you know, in that moment, this just deep settling in my spirit. That's the way I want to pass on from this life. The natural fullness of a life that has walked with you and gone through tr tremendous joy and sorrow. And I am simply passing from this life into the next. Your presence so familiar to me that it's just now uh, entering into a fullness moment. Uh, there was a, a beautiful experience I had many years ago, and, and these all relate to some of the things we'll, we'll talk about tonight, where I had a dream and it was just uh, probably about 10 years ago, I had a dream. And in the dream, I was sitting up on, in, on a, a, a hospital bed in a hospital. And uh, a nurse came in and basically said to me, you're about to have this surgery and you don't know, we don't know if you'll wake up from it. And in the dream, I sensed that, that experience with my grandfather. And I said these words to the nurse. I said, I've been preparing my entire life for this moment. Like my grandfather and my father before me, 
I'm ready. And I woke up from the dream. Of course, if you've ever had a dream like that, you know, you know, <laughs> you wake up, your emotions are just, just all over the place. But it was this sweetness of saying, you know, Holy Spirit, you, you are leading us on a journey of knowing a journey where we have encounters, as Paul said, he was struggling with the words. Now we see through a glass darkly, then we'll see in full, you know, then we will know as we have been known and anything we can do to increasingly know as we are known and to allow the spirit to know us in those ways that actually expose our vulnerabilities, expose our shame, expose our pain, expose the hopelessness and the fearfulness and all those things. I don't want to say yes to those moments, but having come this far, and I know many of you having come this far, I will not say no to losing as much baggage as possible this side of heaven to enter into the joy of the Lord. And this is part of the work of the Holy Spirit. So um, this morning, I'm just going to actually uh, share my screen now, which I thought I was doing this morning and then found out I actually wasn't. Uh, so I was looking at slides. I thought you were looking at for those who were here, but you weren't. So, uh, you'll, I'll just run through those anyway, because I wanted to do some review. So, uh, this, this afternoon we, uh, there were such pretty pictures. I thought you should all see them, um, because this afternoon we were basically laying a foundation, uh, talking about these, these big ideas that started to emerge as I was journeying with the Holy spirit over these 70 days, uh, in the scriptures that uh, really became a bit archetypal. They became larger categories for the personality, if you will, of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit in Genesis uh, we experience is the Ruach, the breath of God, or what we would call the personal presence of God, the manifest presence of God. And there's a lot of language around that. Of course, it's been explored in libraries and libraries of books, but the Holy Spirit is usually spoken of in the language of metaphors. And uh, there's, there's an old movie called Contact I always loved. It's a sci-fi movie. But basically, a scientist is propelled into space and is seeing all this beauty in front of her. And she says these words. She looks at it all and she says, they should have sent a poet. Because sometimes the language of art and metaphor and music, they capture things that words can't express. And it's why they're so important, I think, in our journey of experiencing God in the fullness of his clarity and his mystery. And so, so we started talking about the Holy Spirit. And, and I said, you know, I wanted to talk a bit about the a brief history of the Holy Spirit this afternoon. But tonight, I want to focus a bit uh, more, more intentionally, a bit more laser focused on experiencing God's presence in our everyday life. And I know you've been through the series that you've been in, and uh, this will maybe be uh, an expansion or some, some complementary ideas to help us along the journey. Um, uh, we, we looked at uh, some questions this morning, but we're taking a journey through the scriptures, and I'm going to do a little bit more of the same of that here this evening, but we're considering the Holy Spirit and the, the personality of the Holy Spirit in biblical history to reflect on how the Spirit moves in and through us. And my dream tonight is that you would leave encouraged, you would leave more hopeful, more filled with joy in the Holy Spirit. There would be something that happens in you, you know, as Elizabeth, when she and Mary met and she felt John the Baptist leap in her womb, that joy of the Holy Spirit, right, at work in that situation and inside of her, I'd pray that we would have that leaping that um, all is not going to hell in a handbasket, neither our lives nor the world around us. God is at work. There is transformation that's both possible and accessible to us. And so we, we talked about this idea that from Genesis to Revelation, the Holy Spirit is at work as God's personal presence in the world. And this is where we get this idea, this emphasis on the spirit as a person. And we get this idea of the Trinity. Of course, that all begins in Genesis 1, where the spirit is introduced right in the first two verses of the Bible. God expresses that he is a maker of things. And he's not only a maker of new things, he is a renewer of the things that he makes. 
He expresses his original intention. And the Spirit's goal is to express the intention of the Father's heart in the world. So he takes the original inky blackness of Genesis 1 and 2, the formless, the empty, and, and in their Hebrew cosmology, the meaningless, and brings meaning, brings God's loving order to it, brings meaning to its features, to its matter, to its, its function in our cosmos as we know it. Again, they didn't think in terms of matter so much when they thought of creation. They thought in terms of God investing his purposes and expressing his intentions for all that is in creation. And so into the meaningless, into the chaos, God speaks his order. And from the beginning of time to the end, we'll see the spirit is always about bringing meaning to meaninglessness, purpose in the midst of purposelessness, God's intended order and design into that which is chaotic and disrupted and distorted. And that's why I think we can even thank God for years like 2020. Oh my goodness. <laughs> what a disruption. <laughs> what a disruption. But in business, a disruption is an innovation. It's a flipping of tables in order to expose some things, to break them down and find a new way forward. This has been a, a holy disruption, and God is expressing fresh meaning into our lives and into the, the form and family of the church through times like these. It's what he's always done. It's what he'll continue to do. So the Spirit sustains then all things. We talked about all life being sustained around us. Um, I mentioned, you know, my neighbor talking to my neighbor and, and uh, just a neighbor going through a job loss and feeling purposeless and what's the meaning of their lives and, you know, do they have uh, a purpose in this world? And I said, of course you do. You're breathing. <laughs> Your heart's beating right in front of me. It means God still has a plan. You know, the spirit sustains all that is around us so we can revel in the majesty of creation. Uh, we talked about beautiful things to us in the chat this morning, things that move us, things that, that inspire us. They are all energized, sustained by God in this grand creation that has unseen and seen expressions. You know, that's different than visible and invisible, right? I, I love to think of it as, as, as uh, my friend at, at Seedbed, J.D. Wald, always says, he says, you know, if I hide something behind my back, it's not invisible, it's unseen to you. And we are dealing with unseen realities all around us that makes them no less real, right? We are living in a world where the ascended Lord in some unseen way, according to Acts 1, is seated at the right hand of the Father. From the Father, the outpoured spirit comes from the ascended Lord from heaven, and we are imbued with strength and power to do life. And I believe that that ultimate power that we are imbued with is love that is then also expressed in acts of what we would determine as, as power and gifts of the spirit through the church. But unless it's motivated by love, the spiritual gifts are useless. They fall apart. And Paul makes a point to communicate this very firmly in 1 Corinthians. If we have not love, it's all a lot of noise. It's all a lot of drama. Love and compassion must always, always lead us. So the spirit energizes the world all around us. But we also see that the Spirit gifts humanity, and the Holy Spirit gifts people in a very wide range of ways. There are natural gifts, and then there are charismata, these gifts of grace or gracelets that uh, come from the Lord to intervene in our lives, in a time, in a place, and through our lives, in the lives of others. We're going to talk a bit more about those tonight. Then uh, we have this idea that we see overarching and running through all of history that the spirit loves. And honestly, I think we could put this first. It seems to be the foundation of the why that God does anything that God does. It is a loving, it is a valuing, it is an affirming, it is a, a strengthening and a reinforcing of identity, not just in understanding who we are, which is where the world stops, which becomes a very tiny story. And honestly, if you go to the movie theaters, you know, I, I frustrate. I have a few friends who are actually filmmakers. They, they do sets for movies and they're involved in, in film because I live in the Nashville area. And, and they get, you know, frustrated with me because they'll come out saying, man, that was a good movie. 
And I say, yeah. And they're like, okay, what's the yeah? It had a great plot line, had great characters. Did you see the effects? Yeah, I loved all the explosions and spaceships. Can you tell I'm a Marvel fan? I'm just saying. But I said, did, did you feel the lack of the meta narrative? Did you feel the ceiling that this was all about who we are, who we are, and who you are? And now who we are because we know who we are. And we, 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 and it keeps hitting a ceiling. Do you ever feel that? I said, this has not just to do with who we are and your superpowers and your identity, right? It's part of the drama and it's why it moves us. But it, this all has to do with whose we are. We live in a context. We are part of a larger plot line and a story that will end in all things being made new. That will end in every person that you know who is under the weight of shame, whether they know it or not, whether they are seeming to thrive and have lots of money or they're at the end of their rope and they wish they could take their lives. Every person out there is hitting a ceiling unless they recover whose they are and who has God given the message of this who's to in the world. He's given it to the church. He's given it to us as our worship language, as our teaching language, as the word of God. Jesus came to communicate to people whose they are so they could understand who they are. So their business cards would change from their name with all their roles and titles and accolades and successes and not their failures. Of course, we don't want those on the business card. That's, that's problematic, right? And we would erase those all and we would come back to Jesus' business card, which is simply your name and then son or daughter. Love started us. Love will finish us. Love will complete us. That's the alpha and the omega we're talking about. Not just stuff being made new, the heart being made new. And the deep work of the Holy Spirit is always the pursuit of the human heart. And so I shared uh, this, this quote uh, this morning. Belovedness is the end goal of all human purpose and meaning. It is belovedness that heals the world and a lack of belovedness that defines its evils. All things point to love. Christ came to love us to life. That is the point of this whole thing. It is, you know, someone said life is the, uh, no, love is the goal and life is the curriculum. I think that was a bumper sticker I saw once. And I thought, hey, a bumper sticker I actually appreciate. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's true. And so, so we come to tonight and I've changed the images where you saw images there of people and animals and creation and stars and all those kinds of things because the spirit's involved in all that. I changed tonight's images to those of fruit because now we're going to talk about the manifestations of what happens when the spirit is invited to rule and reign in our hearts to engage us in this larger story that the father is about in the world, that the son came to bring saving uh, gateways in and healing touches within to transform us from the inside out, that we might become like him over time, the truly beloved one, and we might manifest the same love and power in the world. So obviously, when we see the image of fruit, we think of the fruits of the spirit. But I often see the gifts of the spirit also as fruits of a beloved soul, that ideally that's the way they work. And that's definitely the why they work and why they should work. Now, in my experience, the more love that I have, it doesn't necessarily equate with the more power encounters that I have with people or situations. What it does equate to is deeper moments of connection with people where I sense the Holy Spirit at work, often longer, deeper relationships, and then sometimes transforming encounters within the context of community and love. Now, that's a little bit of a, uh, maybe a mess. I'm getting ahead of myself here, but it's just this idea that the fruit of the Spirit is this idea of what happens when people, John 5, excuse me, John 7, John 15, four to five, what happens when people learn to actually abide in this love? What happens when people actually learn to abide in this vine, to abide in this resource of the spirit's energizing presence and allowing the spirit to then live the life of Jesus through us and produce the fruit that Jesus produces in character, 
in our ethics and in our prayer ministry, in our healing touch, in our, our you know, use uh, or participation in the charismatic gifts. At the same time, we participate with God in natural gifts that he magnifies. So we're going to explore some of this uh, together. And I'm just going to jump through because I have pretty pictures of fruit, but because uh, <laughs> I want you to see every picture of fruit. Um, but I'd like you just to put in the chat, again, for those that weren't with us, the journal is your home base tonight. Um, whatever the Spirit's speaking to you, make that the place you, you focus on. But I'd love to just have us uh, put in the chat, maybe this, this, this question or an answer to it, uh, if you'd like to, to contribute. When it comes to experiencing the Holy Spirit in everyday life, what question do you struggle with the most? Or where is your point of you feel like you hit a wall every time? And just go ahead and however you want to interpret that question, go ahead. But, but when it comes to actually experiencing the Holy Spirit day in and day out, what do you struggle with the most? And I'll share some of, of my own as, as we go and maybe some thoughts that, that could provide some uh, answers or at least encouragements for us along the way. So again, our goal is to experience God's presence in the everyday. So we're talking about this idea that the spirit of God sustains us, the spirit creates, the spirit gifts us, and the spirit communicates the love of the father. Those are our four categories, and we're going to draw on those as we move into more New Testament passages about how we walk in the spirit and keep in step with the spirit. So the Holy Spirit has this purpose that we see in the New Testament. And um, when we actually are putting all these devotionals that I wrote into a book and all the scriptures are in there, so I won't try to cover them all tonight, but somehow I'll get some of these to you. They're also in blog posts uh, form. But this idea seems to pulse at the center as we move from the Old Testament into the New Testament and see these overarching ideas about the personality and work of the Holy Spirit in play. And it's this idea that, that comes pulsing through the New Testament. The Holy Spirit's goal is to form Christ in you. It's for you to become actually like Christ. However, through your unique personality, and limited, though remarkable, gifts. And so you and I are limited beings. And yet each one of us is born with these different unique personality traits that can be both a blessing and, as, as you know, I know from my relationships, can be annoying at times. <laughs> um, but, but we have these gifts. We have personalities that have been shaped by our brokenness, yes, but ultimately the seeds and the, the you know, essential nature of who we are is something made in the image of God. It's beautiful. I think it was, uh, well, well there's a, a poet, I can't remember the, the exact reference. I know it was quoted by um, Nelson Mandela and others uh, throughout, throughout recent history. And it's this idea that our, our greatest problem is not that we're, we're, you know, horrible beings. It's that we haven't embraced what glorious creatures we are. We're afraid of it to see that we are actually these remarkable expressions of the heart and nature of God. And of course, that takes us back to the image of God in which we're made. Again, the Ruach, the breath of God, that is the Hebrew word for spirit, and God breathes into us spirit, and we come to life as God's ambassadors, as God's vice regents in the world, expressing his heart and nature through all our maleness and our femaleness, through all of our personalities and gift mixes and unique tastes and loves, unique family lines and stories. They all come into play. The spirit uses it all. Nothing is wasted. Nothing's irrelevant. Nothing's extra. It's all something the Holy Spirit wants to use. So Jesus is the truly human being, conceived by the Holy Spirit and born to the young Mary. And the Holy Spirit, Paul begins to explore for us, is not only the Spirit sent from the Father, and we see that in the Nicene Creed, this idea of the Spirit from the Father. And then I love in the Nicene Creed where the Holy Spirit is spoken of as the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life. Love that, the giver of life. 
But we see that the Holy Spirit, according to Paul, he says, this is truly the spirit of Jesus. And this is where the Trinitarian language begins to come in and the church begins to realize kind of the fullness of what Jesus was going for when he was surrendering himself to the Father and yet saying, I and the Father are one. And the Spirit reveals and the Spirit expresses the intent of the Father. And you begin to see this interplay going on and it all starts to form this, this singular union uh, of vision of who God is. And Paul speaks of the Spirit as the Spirit of Jesus himself the spirit of Jesus himself in us. And this is why we can become fully human. As uh, as the Bishop Irenaeus of Lyon said in the early years of the church, he said, the glory of God is a human being fully alive. And in the church with the cross, our cruciform living, living according to self-sacrifice and surrender, absolutely But many times the church has become so good at dying to ourselves, we've forgotten how to be fully alive in the presence of God, how to express all that he has given us and made us to be in this world. You know, maybe like some of you, I'm I'm finding, I'm 57 years old, and I'm finding I'm just now beginning to express some of the things that are really in my heart to do. And uh, it's, it's delight and it's challenge, but the Lord's saying, you know, Dan, if it delights you, Like if it really delights you in that holy, beautiful way, it probably delights me. Have you ever thought about that? I actually like you that much, you know, and there's a whole process of the spirit helping us get comfortable in our own skin. Again, not so our story ends with us, but it ends with whose we are and then communicates to others whose they are, who they belong to. So let's have some fun here. So we'll take that, that, that first category that we did this morning. We're going to use the same categories, but now we're going to take the Spirit's character and bring it into some uh, New Testament ideas. The Spirit creates, but now instead of just speaking into the chaos and creating all that is seen and unseen, the Spirit is continually creating and recreating whole people. People who experience and express the shalom of God, the peace of God in the world. And I love this idea that the Holy Spirit brings new creation wholeness into the chaos of people's hearts. Jesus replied to Nicodemus, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. And Jesus answered, he's confusing Nicodemus. Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and born of the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh. And Jesus is not saying that's a problem. He's saying flesh gives birth to flesh. The story stops here. Yes, flesh gives birth to flesh. But the spirit gives birth to spirit. The fullness of who you are is not only a body that's alive, but a spirit that's alive. And all around us, people are alive physically, but their spirits are in a sleep unto death. There is brokenness. There is blindness. There is darkness. And you and I know, I mean, we know from our own lives of of healing and transformation, we know when we meet someone and we see that shame just covering them, or we see that fear or that anger just continually being let loose because they don't know what to do with it or where it's come from. And we look them in the eye and we know where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. You could get rid of all this. You could stop the self-hatred. You could stop the bitterness toward anyone who's not like you or doesn't think like you. You could stop dying on the inside and you could begin to come alive. And we know when we see it, when the love of God takes a hold of a heart, it's a beautiful thing to watch. It's a beautiful thing to experience and to fan and to flame. So there will never be a time when the human heart will not be at the center of the world's blessing and illnesses. It is the heart to which the spirit attends always to do what the spirit did at creation, bring God's original intention to full manifestation in each single solitary life. There is no life that that has not been the spirit's intent. And I don't understand all of human history, how it works and God's presence in it all. But I do understand from the scriptures that this is the intention of God. And so you see down here in the bottom right, I put a little act on it. 
Pursue Christ-likeness in your own life. Pursue actually becoming a disciple of Jesus. One of the things I, things I think we saw in the, the struggles of 2020 and then the, the still the strangeness that is there in 2021, and the truth is it's been there for a long time, <laughs> but one of the things that we saw is I think what Dallas Willard said, uh, really coming to light, he said, the problem with many churches is that many people who are sitting in the seats have never actually decided to follow Jesus. Like they're there for another reason. There's some other thing that's drawn them. And it's not that he doesn't bless the community life and love and like all those things are part of this. Yes. But at the end of the day, if the heart is not his, when troubles and trials come and the shaking happens, we fall away. Now, the early church saw that in graphic detail because they were continually in a persecuted state. And the pressures from the culture around them were, in a sense, you know, calling them to count the cost when they said yes to Jesus. We don't have that same kind of dynamic. And so we're in a time, I think, where increasingly there may come greater pressures for us to truly decide if we are following Jesus or following another way and thinking we're following Jesus in it. Now, that's a, that's a world to explore. <laughs> Many of us are nodding our heads going, it's true, right? When these things get exposed, we see that there are isms and ists and alls and ifs and all sorts of things that we have made Jesus the mascot of. The ascended Lord of heaven and earth will not be made the mascot of our preferences and prejudices and ideologies and all the things that end with a story of who we think we are and how to fix it all. Love is what is ultimately going to fix it, and the church is called to embody it, even as we do justice and love mercy and care for the weak and care for ourselves in this journey. You know, there's a big turn right now toward mindfulness practices. And honestly, it's been helpful for me to learn ways to quiet myself, to, to you know, um, just come to a place where I'm, I'm checking in on my own heart, my own emotions, you know, just breathing deeply and, and kind of getting in touch again. But mindfulness without Jesus is, is, has a ceiling to it. It's helpful to a degree but it's not the fullness of what God intended, where we are growing not only in awareness, self-awareness, but we're growing in Christ awareness. And we are allowing him to speak into those areas of brokenness that only he can heal. You know, I've seen uh, in therapist's office and, and I've been, I've been uh, through therapy. I, I have a great counselor that's helped me through some amazing things. I have a spiritual director um, and I have just people who are, who are mentors who speak into my life and try to just stay open. But, you know, I have never seen a, a prostitute, a girl who was involved in prostitution, walk into a therapist's office and come out within a few hours feeling like she is as innocent and as pure and beloved as any, any child could ever imagine they are. But I have watched Jesus do that firsthand. A girl come from such brokenness, such a shattered soul life, and in an encounter with Jesus, believe that she is beloved, that she is valuable, that she's precious, that Jesus has made her life whiter than snow, that she's got a new beginning, that she's born again. I've watched it happen, and I've seen street people come in off the streets and covered in shame and watch the Holy Spirit meet them in community and by the power of the Spirit, just meeting them in their soul in the midst of worship. I've seen them with hands raised, finding themselves provided for by the Lord who loves them. You know, and we've seen though we have these stories, right? And I'm looking, I'm going, yeah, our best therapy can't do this. Good things can happen. The spirit works through it, but we have to know the spirit is the only one who can utterly change the heart. And that's what Jesus, that's what Jesus came to do. So, so the spirit creates whole people. And as he creates whole people, there is this, there's something about the heart of God and some would argue, and it's, it's the, the argument that I find myself most comfortable with, some would argue that it's actually the reason that we exist. God didn't need us, but he certainly wanted to share it all. I don't know how that works. I'm happy for mystery, happy to live in the tension, see through the mist, you know, but I like that. I, that's belovedness. 
It's like my wife and I, we didn't have to have kids, but we wanted to. We wanted to share and widen the circle, right? And so the circle is widened. So as we are made whole, the goal of the spirit is then to be at work in us and through gifts of the spirit, through who he's forming us to be in Christ, for us to spread that love. So the spirit sustains people. Now I'm going to use that, that word in the beginning to say the spirit, the spirit sustains all life. But here I want to talk about the spirit sustaining freedom in people's hearts, sustaining people through the wounds that we inevitably bear, not only in our past, but in our present and probably will in our future. The spirit sustains us. The spirit carries us. The Holy Spirit actively sets people free and then builds the church. The Spirit loves the church, loves the local church. You know, it's so funny when I hear people saying the church is this, the church is that, the church is this. You have to hear me. I get what they're getting at. But number one, I am not aware of the church global. I'm truly not aware of everything that is happening everywhere. I am not omniscient. I am not all-knowing. So when I say the church is this or that, I'm speaking of a very limited vision I might have of the church, right? And we tend towards seeing the brokenness, right? So we tend to whine about the things that aren't working. But there's also a lot of glory of God at work in the church and around the world. I, I have the privilege of being in a... Um, a doctoral program right now that is filled with, I think we have 35 nations represented in our program. And I'll get in these breakout rooms in Zoom with, with uh, sisters and brothers from Myanmar and from Kenya and from so many places. And they're not wrestling with the same issues we're wrestling with. The pandemic, yes, we're all dealing with the pandemic. But, you know, I'll say something that I just think is, is uh, you know, so difficult for us and everyone's dealing with it. And I'll even use this all encompassing language. The church is blah, blah. And, and literally one of them will just look at me. Uh, this, this sister from Myanmar just kind of looked at me over Zoom and, and just called me out. She's like, we're not dealing with that at all. We have uh, tribes in war that are coming over borders and we're having to figure out how to love them in Jesus' name and help them get through the trauma, the children get through the trauma. They've, you know, and I'm like, yeah, we have some of those things, but it's different, right? And they just began to say, here's what we're dealing with. Here's what we're dealing with. And I'm watching these heroic people just living out the Jesus life where they're at. And so, so there is freedom that the Holy Spirit's bringing in you and through you and I in our world. Right now, I'm probably looking at in this Zoom call, people who are silent heroes, faithfully being Jesus to those within your reach. And some of us will do it in overt and profound ways. Some of us will stand on stages and, you know, be able to teach about it, Brian. <laughs> you know, some of us will stand, you know, and do these different things. Others of us will silently care for one person. We'll write a note or a letter that, that is this, this point of revelation and encouragement to someone. And it all matters. It's all part of what the Spirit is doing through the church. So we see in verse uh, 2 Corinthians 3, 17 to 18, this, this powerful verse. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all who with unveiled faces, he's leaning back to the Moses image, we often see in talking about the spirit, this reaching back as, as I shared this morning, the Bible project, um, Tim Mackey calls it hyperlinks. This is another hyperlink where he's referring to Moses experiencing the fullness of the presence of God, that he has to veil his face for the glory. He's saying we all who with unveiled faces, we don't need to hide this. We contemplate the Lord's glory. We stare in the face of of the Lord and his glory. And we are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the spirit. We are all shining increasingly. Let it be, Lord. I, I want to pass from this life and for you to pass from this life with your face glowing with the presence of God. And if you've ever experienced someone who loves Jesus passing in a moment, it's, it's beautiful to me. It's it's very difficult, but I just say, oh, Lord, just let me be at that place of intimacy with you as that, that moment occurs. And so how we act on it. You know, 
how does freedom happen in our lives? We see in the scriptures some very specific language around freedom. And often what we see, Paul often leads the way in it, is the language of belovedness and experiencing the love of God. And so I've asked myself a few things as I've pursued healing in my own life. You know, I'm I'm 57 and something about 2020, as you all know, and probably experienced something about the convergence of all the issues around us culturally in our own lives, something about the convergence of things began to expose areas of brokenness and trauma in me that I thought were dealt with. And my goodness, it was taking me right back to my childhood. And and I am amazed at the amount of pain that began to emerge in my life. One of the things that I found was true in this is in this experience of finding healing and finding the, the freedom of the Lord so that we can convey it to others has honestly been worship for me. Now, let me just just say a little bit around that. A dramatic thing happens with the Apostle Paul, who one could argue is, has, you know, is one of the best examples of a hard heart that exists in the scriptures. He is seeing the way in front of him, which was the name of the early church, which was called the way because Jesus was the way, but they also understood that to be the way of love, which, which we'll talk about in a passage, eagerly follow the way of love, Paul will say after he does the love chapter in Corinthians eagerly follow this way. This is the way of Jesus in the world. Paul's heart is hard. He's knocked off his horse, Acts 8, Acts 9, it spills over into. He's knocked off his horse. He falls to the ground. And this, this, you know, this leader, this influencer, this person who is orchestrating, killing people and seeming to do it happily. He's standing in affirmation over Stephen's death. Whatever it was that made Saul, Saul, he was legalistic. He was tied to his devotion. And I believe with all my heart, he believed that God had raised him up for such a time as that. Something happens to him on the ground. And, you know, there's a lot of conjecture around it. What happens to Saul? What happens when he hits the ground and he's blind? And Jesus has nothing to say to him. He has nothing to say to him except, you know, uh, you know, who is it, Lord? <laughs> and he says, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. And you can bet psychology, you know, psychologists call it cognitive dissonance. It just starts going all over the map in his mind, right? This is the Lord who's just blinded me, knocked me off my horse. And then the next words are get up and go, and you'll be told what to do next. And the man is this strong leader who believes he's following God, is led by the hand led by the hand, blind. The scriptures tell us later, he disappears for three years. In Galatians, it tells us that, where he's going to be schooled by the Holy Spirit. Here is all we know. The productive work of Paul. If you read through the epistles, what is the one theme that comes up over and 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 over over again? I pray that you may grasp how wide and how deep, how full, how glorious is the love of God for us in Christ Jesus. The man becomes a virtual love letter to the world. And I believe that is what disoriented all the people who saw him after that. That that conversion was a conversion to love. And Saul it became Paul because love blinded him and he became consumed with the love of God for his soul. Now, however we experience that, my, my, initial, my initial thought is yes, do that thing. Worship in, and you know, within the context of all this, right? But worship is one of the ways that um, we find, and I found that deep healing comes in people. So this morning, um, I, I woke up with a weight, some, some situations going on in our lives, people I'm praying for, my wife's with uh, some family members right now, a funeral in Washington, D.C., and, uh, and I just woke up just heavy, and I turned on, I don't know if any of you like Maverick City's uh, music, uh, it's been very helpful to me in this season of my journey, and I put on the song Gyra, 
And I stood in my kitchen and about halfway through the song, I just stopped what I was doing. And I stood in the middle of my kitchen and I turned up the music and I stood there. I played the song through twice and it's like a 10 minute song each time. So it was 20 minutes. And I just stood there dancing with my hands open tears then began to fall true, true tears. You know, people say that, but then they're actual tears. They were actual tears, right? Streaming down my face, just the Holy spirit ministering to me. And I was lingering in his presence in worship. And that's why I, in, in many ways, I think that's why I'm a worship leader. It's why I'm so committed to it, to seeing people encounter God in worship is because I walked out of that moment, just another thin layer healed more whole more aware of the love of God for me today, his provision for us today. Something else happened in me. I got in my car and I went to go get gas in the car. These are, this, is, this is real life, right? Where the Holy Spirit meets us. I went to go get gas in my car. I pulled up at the gas station and I looked across the street and I saw a young man walking with headphones on. And his head was down and he was walking. And I don't know... What, what triggered it in me? I think it was me being so moved by the song, so open to God in worship. My heart just filled up with compassion for this young man. And I thought, I don't know what he's listening to, but my only hope would be that it's music that leads him into the fullness of God's love for him and his healing uh, and his pursuit of his heart. And, you know, probably 99% chance that wasn't what he was listening to right? 99% chance. But that's for me why I love all sorts of artistic music and all sorts of art and creativity. But one of the reasons I love and I'm committed to worship music is because it feeds us with the word of God. It feeds us with enduring truth. It feeds us with an atmosphere and creates an atmosphere where we can respond to the spirit's communication of the love of God. I was filled with compassion and I had finished filling my tank and I just sat in my car for another five minutes. No one was behind me and I just interceded for this young man's life, that he would encounter God, that he would meet with God in his journey. So there are chains at work in the world, keeping people in bondage to choking sin and generational brokenness. The spirit aims for these to bring freedom where the heart is still in the grip of the accuser. And I think that's where we see ourselves not only worshiping and pursuing our own freedom, but then pursuing the freedom of others. You know, I, I, I turned a major corner and I, I looked through even these 70 days of reflection on the Holy Spirit. I turned a major corner in my evangelism when I stopped feeling like the first words out of my mouth needed to be explicit gospel language. I turned a corner when I realized that my first work in evangelism is to be compassionate and to actually express authentic love and value to a person. Anyone that I've led to the Lord, and I haven't led a lot of people to the Lord over my lifetime, I just haven't. It hasn't been a primary leading gift for me. I'm more wired as a, as a teacher. But those people that I have that have come to faith, they were over years, all of them. My neighbor, a friend down the street. Um, you know, I've looked at that and I thought, I'm, I'm one of those guys that takes 10 years to lead someone to Jesus, right? Till they finally say, what's the reason for the hope that's in you, right? What is that? And sometimes it works sooner than that, but it takes time for them to come to recognize that this could be their story as well, but uniquely, uniquely designed for them. So the spirit gives and brings freedom. And we see this throughout the New Testament. You know, um, the spirit quenches our thirst the Spirit um, uh, gives us the fruit of the Spirit to manifest uh, God's heart in our lives. Let me just see if I'm getting, a, I'm getting a little ahead of myself there. But the Spirit gives us these ways to experience freedom ourselves increasingly, and He gives people to minister to us, to pray for us. How many of you have ever received a word from the Lord that unlocked you in a moment it just opened you, and to this day, you feel like you're the echo. You still feel it echoing in your life. How many? Just go ahead and raise your hand if you've had that. Isn't that sweet? It is so sweet because someone decided in a moment that they would respond to the subtle impression of the Holy Spirit, and they would actually act 
and come up to you and say it to you or pray it for you or linger over you compassionately in prayer. I've had people who stood there with me while I stood at a conference or in a service in worship with my hands open. They've just stood there silently with silently with me for 15 minutes, 20 minutes, just with their hand blessing what the Lord was doing in me. I am like, thank you for not feeling like your words are always what the Spirit's doing. Spirit was at work in me, and I was seeing pictures and being convinced of love again. And man, these are the things the Spirit does through us. He sustains us and then uses us to, to sustain others. We could spend so much more time on each one of these, but we're just kind of exploring the Spirit's heart. And then the Spirit gifts the church for mission. So if I haven't said it convincingly enough, the spirit adores the church. The church was built for speed in all the the clumsiness of it, how we try to figure it out organizationally and how we try to work things out and how we try to do things this side of heaven. It's complex. But if love leads us and love is each one of our motivation, ultimately, there is a sweetness that the spirit will, will bring to even the most challenging dynamics. So the Holy Spirit gives both spiritual gifts and spiritual fruit to signal that the kingdom is here. There will never be a time. I like using that phrase because I think it's true. There will never be a time when people do not need to see a new thing embodied in front of them in a person. There will never be a time where we can just talk about it. We could just sing about it. We can just you know, do all the, the, the display of it. It will always take someone who is embodying this life within them, making progress in their heart for someone else to say, maybe that could be true for me. It's viral. It's contagious. It is the intent of the Lord that it works that way. And if we hide ourselves, and, and hear me, I'm a big fan of hiddenness for seasons and for different reasons. Seasons and reasons. I didn't even mean for that to rhyme, but but it just happened. Someone write that down. It was a wonderful moment there. Um, great moments in sports, you know. Uh, but there are reasons and there are seasons to be silent, to recede. And then there are seasons, you know, some people say the, the extroverts, I'm, I'm a very high introvert on the Myers-Briggs who happens to be expressive. So no one believes me when I say it, but it's true, right? Um, I, I tend to thrive uh, and feel really energized when I'm alone and writing or, or by myself, worshiping, whatever it might be. And it tends to be harder for me to be in public settings for extended periods of time. I have to go back and recharge and then I do it. But the spirit spoke to me many years ago, Dan, I don't need you to be always in a retreat and then in advanced mode. I just need you to be in a retreat at times and then a show up mode, be present. Be perceptive, be aware. While you're standing in that room, in that um, work situation, that is a, maybe it's a Christmas party coming up for my wife's job or wherever. Here's an option, Dan. Instead of just thinking about how delicious that bacon wrapped water chestnut or, 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 or something is, you could actually look around the room and say, Spirit of God, what are you saying for that person? And then I sit with it. As I'm standing there and he says, I don't want you to say it. I just want you to pray this for them. I want you to take away this impression and begin to pray for them. And because of sometimes our unbelief in prayer, we don't lean into that. But if we started to really believe that prayer does what it actually does, praying for them is as hot an action to do as talking to them. But the spirit sometimes will say, I want you to go share a word of encouragement with them. I want you to say it in a certain way. My, my daughter and I were, were in a restaurant um, not too long ago, and, and uh, the waitress came up to us, and, and she was in her 20s, clearly, and we were sitting there, and, and we were about to order, and as soon as she walked up, I just had a flash come through my mind. Now, I want you to hear me. When I share personal stories, it's not to highlight my stories. It's because they're the, I'm the most aware of them right? Sometimes I I think we can overdo our own story. I I like to tell other people's stories a lot, right? But this was just a very personal one. The girl walks up to our table and an image flashes in front of me of her in a cap and a gown. Now, just like a graduate. 
And now it's just an image in my mind. And I have a choice in that moment. I can trust that the Holy Spirit gave me something, or I can just let it go. The worst that could happen is that I'm going to pray for her, whatever that might relate to. So there's always a gift of love that's involved, right? But in this case, I, I felt like the Lord showed me something about her story. And so she came up and, and we placed our order. And I, I just said, excuse me, can I just ask you a question? And then I was just trying to follow, get, you know, just kind of stream of consciousness, uh, as, as one writer calls it, live stream, <laughs> the Holy Spirit impression. I just said, are you considering going back to school, but you're reluctant? And she stepped back, did that face that's sort of like, and I thought, okay, that's one of two faces. It's either the, you're crazy, get out of here, I need another person to take this table, or something just happened. And she leans back, and my daughter's just sitting there smiling at her, and I'm smiling. And she leans forward, and she says, yes, I'm considering going back to, to school, but I'm really not sure I can do it. She just starts getting really vulnerable. I mean, we are priests. This is an actual thing in the scripture that we are a place where people will tend to confess if we're living open lives like that. They'll tend to open up. There will be a, a, a leaning in sometimes when we wish they didn't. Uh, that's happened to me a few times. Happened to me on an airplane once. Oh my goodness. And, and someone began to open up really loudly in the back seat beside me. And, uh, and the Holy Spirit gave me a word for them. And I'll, maybe I'll tell you that story later, but it just quieted things. But, but it's just this confessional. We're like a walking confessional space, right? And she just said to me, I, I am thinking of going back to school, but I'm, I'm not sure I can do it. I, I don't feel like I'm smart enough. Like this is maybe the time to do it. And then the Holy Spirit just gave me this thing. He just said, I want you to speak to her like I'm speaking to her. And I said, you are going to do well. You go back to school. You're going to graduate and you're going to be glad you did it. So you go with confidence. And, and she just kind of like straightened up. I was like, okay, okay, okay. All right. I said, I, I believe. And, and sometimes I don't feel like, I always feel like God says I need to give a caveat. But in this case, I did. I said, I believe God speaks to people, and uh, I felt like he, he showed me that you're going to have success going back to school. And she took a deep breath, and she smiled the rest of the time serving us. Like, it was just a very sweet thing. And then I said to her at the end, I said, I'll, I'll pray for you as you consider going back to school. And she said, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm going to do it, you know? I was like, yes, you know, go, Lord, whatever you're doing. Let me just be another part of the story. You know, we don't always have to be the whole story for someone. We can just be our little part to play. We don't know what's happening. You know, many of you are nodding because, you know, even in your own life, people have been a part of something, right? So the, the spirit gives us gifts. Now we could talk a lot about the actual gifts of the spirit that are listed out. I'm just going to share with you from my own studies and, and, and experience over the years that first of all, there's a great symphony of spiritual gifts at work in the church and in the world. I don't believe that any of them are better than any other, especially when love is leading them. But I do believe that there are, there are moments when we have an opportunity to partner with the Holy Spirit in a way that will, will utterly subvert the story that someone has been listening to and obeying in their life. I've begun to think, and, and you might know this even from some experiences you had today. When I walk away from a moment because I was afraid to deliver that word of encouragement or that moment, I now walk away knowing and just aware in that moment that that person could go on to live their life for the rest of their life out of the broken narrative that they've been living out of to date. And the Lord's moment of intervention may be me. Now, the cool thing there is there's no guilt in that. I don't feel like I have to be everything for everyone. That's what the Holy Spirit's job is. That's why intercession is so powerful. We can participate in people's lives without ever exerting those actions. But there are moments the Spirit says here and now. So I'll finish the story. I was on the back of this plane. A businessman came on the plane. I had a seat open to me for a five-hour flight beside me. It was the last seat on the plane. They were starting to close the door. And I thought, I get to be alone for five hours. And I this is no exaggeration. There's a bustle at the door. And this 
big businessman comes in, clearly no social skills. He's hitting people in the head with his roots, you know, his briefcase as he walks by, literally. He's just loud. Hey, everybody, thank you. You know, I'm like, oh, no, 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 please don't make a beeline for my seat. It's the last seat on the plane. He sits down beside me. We start, we start to go down the runway. And I'm not exaggerating. I don't have my Bible out. I don't have anything out. There's no indication that I'm a Christian. He leans over to me and he says, hey, you believe in God? I'm like, Oh no, I could just watch. I saw little wings on my five hour clock just flying out the window. (laughs) And I was like, oh, that's okay. It's okay. Dan, the Lord wants to do something. He says, do you believe in God? And I said, well, yeah, I do happen to believe in God. At the time I was pastoring. I didn't want to tell him I was a pastor. I just wanted just to see where this goes. He begins to offload this confession of everything he's done. He had taken lives in the military. He had such guilt over it all. And he's just loud. I mean, everyone in the last three rows is hearing everything he's saying. And he's just going on and he's kind of leaning in like he's whispering to me, but he doesn't know what whispering means. So he's being really loud. And then he tells me, he says, and you know what? He said, my little girl is laying in a hospital room right now with no no hope that she will live out the year. And you know what she does? And this is, this is true. I'm not exaggerating the story, guys. He said, you know what she does? My little girl gets out of her bed and she walks around to the other people in the, in the ward and she encourages them and she's kind to them. And she even prays for some of them. It's like, she's like eight years old, guys, eight years old. He said, she does that. And you know what? It makes me hate God all the more. I just hate him for that. And I'm finding it. I, I, I'm thinking to myself, it's funny. The God you don't believe in you just a minute ago. Now you're saying you hate. Hmm. So you actually realize you're dealing with with someone on the other side of this pain, right? Anyway, and he just begins to express this all, and he's getting more and more animated, and the Holy Spirit, just a phrase goes through my mind. Now, again, guys, this is just normal Christianity for us, but a phrase goes through my mind, and it's this. Ask him who Rebecca is and what place she has in his life, and I'm okay. This could be one of those, you are a crazy person, like moments in the back of the plane. And he's not the kind to keep it quiet and just ignore me. <laughs> He'd be like the kind of, what the hell are you talking about? What, I don't, you know, you're crazy, we're really, whatever, fanatic, whatever. But, I, but I, I swallow it and I say, Lord, I'm stepping off this cliff. Like, okay, here we go. And he is at the height of his sort of anger and he's frustrated and people are starting to look back because they see, I honestly, I think he was manifesting something right there in the moment. Like it was, it was full on anger and he was starting to, to just, you know, get that angry face that you realize this guy's out of control right now. And I stopped him and I put my hand on his shoulder and I said, who is Rebecca and what place does she have in your life? And his face literally went from that angry sort of fierce face to just wide-eyed. And he said, how do you know Rebecca? I said, who is Rebecca and what place does she have in your life? I don't know who Rebecca is, but I believe that God speaks to people. And he spoke to me, who is Rebecca and what place does she have in your life? And he goes silent and he puts his head down and he said, Rebecca is my girlfriend. Upon landing this plane, I was about to call and break up with her. And the reason I'm about to break up with her is because she's trying to get us to go back to church. And I'm sick of her constantly pestering me about going back to church and getting our lives together. And he said, I've had it. He said, so tell me more. (laughs) I'm like, I don't have any more. But I began just to speak to him about probably the good intentions that Rebecca is actually responding to God whispering to her and that his daughter is actually a sign and a wonder in his life to tell him that God loves him and that God loves her and that God's goodness does not change simply because she's dealing with an illness. In fact, right now it's brought him to the end of himself so that he might surrender himself to the love that's been pursuing him his entire life. And for the next five hours, we talked about Jesus. And as we were walking out, He said to me, he said, you know what? I didn't believe in God when I got on this plane. He said, but now I think I probably believe in God and I'll give Jesus a chance. And I'm, you know, guys, 
I say that, and I always say that with a bit of sort of fear and trepidation, and because I was so, if you've done these things or had those experiences, it's so humbling. Like you're not like, yay, hey, how about that? Need to try, get a T-shirt for those moments. It's just like, thank you, Holy Spirit, that I did not utterly blow it, and someone's life continued on a downward spiral because I was, I was just wanted to read my magazine. Like, thank you, Lord, that I got to participate. And what does that do? It fills us with more faith to pursue people with love and compassion. And whether God's speaking to you right now, even as we're talking about your neighbor and you're writing just a a, a few notes to give them a word of encouragement, it doesn't even have to sound Christian as you write it. You don't have to mention one part of the Trinity in it, but you can, if the Lord gives you that, that sense of guidance, follow those impressions. One of the things that I saw in, in the study over those 70 days is just how often people are running with their impressions. Joseph ran with dreams. Mary was ex- Mary had to be experiencing something that led her to that moment when the angel said that to her. She was just going, let it be to me as the Lord has spoken. I'm used to obedience. Like, I'm, I'm a yes girl. I, I've always said yes to him. Like, yeah, why wouldn't I say yes again? Like, she was someone who was learning to follow the Spirit's leading. And, and we see it throughout the New Testament, people just following promptings. And while the, the images are more dramatic that we see in the New Testament, we see throughout church history and throughout our experience and your experience that, that the Lord uses us to give people words of life, to lead them to Psalm 1611, back to the path of life from which they have been straying and wandering. You know, when we think about the damage that people take into their lives, I mean, we know our own from family backgrounds and just what we got and what we didn't and all of that and how we live out of these false narratives. Why would we not want to participate with God in bringing a loving narrative to bring wholeness, whether we're, we're dealing with practical issues of, of, you know, teaching children or, or working in, in the job that we're doing, et cetera, that we could be Jesus. I often ask myself, like, Dan, I know you don't know what to do in this situation, but could you just be Jesus? Could you just be Christ-like? Let's just go for that. Let's just, let's just hit that mark. Let's, let's be Jesus as far as you know. And that's where we get into um, this image of, of the gifts. And we see here Coloss- uh, excuse me, Galatians 5. But the fruit of the Spirit, meaning the Spirit of Jesus in us, the spirit that comes from the father that brings order to chaos that sustains all things that gives gifts that expresses and pursues us in love the fruit of that spirit living in you christ living in you the hope of glory as paul said the fruit of that spirit that personality within you moving through your personality is all manner of expressions personality diverse in all their beautiful ways all these expressions of love and joy, and peace, and forbearance, or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. This is called the fruit of the Spirit. So not only do we experience the charismata, which means the gracelets of healing and the other gifts that are talked about in the New Testament, we also experience um, an ethical formation, a character formation that makes us different kinds of people. What is it like to have people uh, in your neighborhood who are truly deeply forgiving and patient? Now, patience is a very interesting one. It's one of the only ideas and concepts that we have multiple treatises written by the early church writers uh, related to a, as a virtue. They talk about love, but they also talk about patience because patience was not a virtue in their culture. Their belief was that patience, impatience is what people do who don't trust God for everything. And so they would write, they would teach patience as a primary virtue as of the church. And I thought today, wow, I think we could use some of that teaching again because patience demands trust. Why do we go to war? It's impatience with love. It's impatience. It's impatience. Why? And again, I, I'm, I'm making macro things micro for a minute, but what drives us to, you know, demand things and do, it's impatience. It's all impatience. It's us not trusting God. It's us forcing our way, as Eugene Peterson wrote, forcing our way in life, right? 
goodness, faithfulness. And one of the things that I do when you have that act on it in the bottom right is I just try to practice the thing. Sometimes the fruit will naturally emerge from me. You don't hear fruit trees, you know, groaning and grunting in an orchard trying to put out their fruit, right? It's the natural outflow of a life that's abiding. That is John uh, 15, four and five, the word for abide in me in the, in, in the vine and I will abide in you is the word meno. It means stay. It means just stay, just don't go. So your greatest act of faithfulness by the power of the Holy Spirit today could just be to stay with Jesus rather than going, right? It doesn't have to be this big, great action. It just means do whatever it takes to keep you rooted and established in love. Do whatever that takes. And then I find that if I'm not acting uh, in ways that I think are, are, are you know, from the Lord, if I'm in fear, whatever, I'll just go back to this list and try to practice it. Instead of just, you know, sometimes it'll come from us, but sometimes we could practice it from the outside in. I'm going to practice patience now. I am not going to, you know, make that phone call because I'm demanding this or whatever that might be. I'm just going to practice it. God, I'm going to practice gentleness in the face of someone coming at me with harshness. I'm going to, I'm going to practice that. I'm going to practice in this, this phone call with a family member who sees things a certain way politically and always feels like that needs to be the second thing we talk about every time we get on the phone. I'm just going to practice right now gentleness with them and self-control, and I'm going to see if I can lead us to love because that's the fruit of the Spirit and let them know they're valued and loved, whether we agree or not or whether we even talk about it or not. So, that kind of leads us to the last one, and I, I want to finish with this and, and move to some, some Q&A time um, and some reflections on, on maybe what, what moved us here. But the Spirit loves through a Spirit-responsive church. Now, if you go through the Old and New Testament, you see this constant evidence that while the Holy Spirit can move sovereignly in people's lives and convey love, which he has. Some people have had dreams. No one was able to preach the gospel to them. They've had dreams. The love of God has come to them. There are ways I'm sure God wins the human heart, and we would never expect that we'll see them in heaven, as Lewis said, but we'll find people there that there's just a total shock to us, right? But the Spirit loves through a Spirit-responsive church. It's what we're built for, is to be conduits for the Holy Spirit, both, I think, containers of and conduits for the Holy Spirit, if, if we want to use that, that water imagery. The Holy Spirit trains us to hear the Father's voice and to see what the Father is doing. If we do not have love, we have lost the plot. It's not our outrage and challenging that wins the world. It's our faith expressing itself through love. So we see in 1 Corinthians 14, 1, after Paul has talked about spiritual gifts, Gordon Fee uh, has written a wonderful book on that. He's out of the Pentecostal tradition on the Holy Spirit. Um, but he, he always writes, instead of spiritual gifts, he writes capital S, spirit, dash, you will. So spiritual gifts, spirit-inspired gifts. After he talks about all these spiritual gifts, then he explores the way of love. And he says this, this simple verse in 14.1, follow the way of love first then eagerly desire the gifts. So we should ask the Lord for spiritual gifts, but we follow the way of love first. Now, that, that stirs up in my own heart as I think about this today, um, how we can practically act on becoming spirit-responsive Christians. And the only words that come to me come uh, just, just right from Jesus. He's he, he has an opportunity to tell another parable. N.T. Wright says that the parables were not meant to be stories that Jesus told. They actually were actions of the kingdom, his telling of the story. Like they were spiritually um, imbued actions, his storytelling. They weren't just telling a story about an idea. They were the idea. Now, I, I love this idea because when he gets into this moment of, of the Good Samaritan, He's making a, a sacramental point. It's a sacramental point that a sacred action is to love your neighbor. It is embedded in the worship life of the Christian to love the stranger, to love 
the, the familiar, the unfamiliar, and it is to act on it. And so, so what we see in, in the New Testament, especially that as the Spirit is revealing Jesus and the Spirit is this deposit on the new creation to come and the Spirit is all these different theological, um, it's a theological pivot point for so many things in our faith. There is just this simplifying that comes in Jesus' teaching that if we are acting in love, the spirit can then be empowering our actions as we are yielding to the spirit working through us in those moments. So we make, if there's a next step, it is to follow the way of love eagerly and then eagerly desire the gifts of the Holy Spirit. But following the way of love is very practical. Is there someone in your sphere of influence that the spirit might prompt you to love in a fresh and new way right now? Is there someone? Is there a name that comes to mind? Is there a face? Let's assume that that's the Holy Spirit. One of the things I, I think it's so important for us to embrace is, is this, this simple idea that the Holy Spirit's speaking all the time. Like the Holy Spirit is speaking. Now, there are times I do think that there's silence, and I feel like I've dealt with that, and you guys have the silence of God in seasons. But even in that, there's a speaking that happens. There's a, uh, in a sense, that pregnant pause that is in relationships because something needs to be processed. Something needs to be unearthed that only silence can, can unearth in a situation. But the Holy Spirit is, is always speaking. And right now, if I even look on this Zoom call and I see a face or a name, I can ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, are you saying something about this person right now? And, uh, and so I'll look at Larry here just for a moment. And, and the spirit is speaking, but the, the only change happening in me is I didn't receive some amazing revelatory download. What I did was I turned my attention toward Larry. And as I turned my attention toward Larry, I just saw a picture. And the picture I saw, I'll submit it to you, Larry, but you know, in front of everyone, it was a key going into a lock, like one of those old locks, the, the big ones with the ornate key. And I felt like the Lord said that it's complicated, but it's also simple, right? The key has a lot of curving on it, but it's built for the lock to open it. And so I felt like, I, I didn't feel like there's a lot more than that to it, but it was just, you know, yeah, maybe some things feel complicated right now, but I felt like the Lord was saying, but actually it's simple. Your response in this situation can be simple. And I'm going to open up maybe an area you feel like there's, there's a roadblock going on. Is that okay? And, and in that moment, I'll submit that to Larry. I often say that if I'm praying for someone, I say, I just submit that to you. It's what I discern the Holy Spirit saying. Um, my experience has been sometimes it's meaningful in the moment to someone. Sometimes it's like a year later, and I've had the experience of calling someone and saying, you know, you gave me that, that, that picture a year ago, and I thought it was silly then. And I, I usually, I'm very candid in those moments. I'm like, yeah, it means nothing to me. <laughs> when someone asks me, does that mean anything to you? I'm like, no, it means nothing, right? But I said, I, re I remember that, and it now means something to me. I'm remembering it, and, and it really matters to me now. So I think we can we can see ourselves as almost like antenna. If you don't turn the radio on, you won't get the frequencies that are all out there, right? But if you turn the radio on, you'll start to receive things. So I think one of our, our, uh, one of our missions as spirit responsive people is to actually make ourselves available to be spoken to by the Holy Spirit. We put out our perceiving sensibilities and say, spirit, do you have something for someone here, for this person? And then we, with humility, offer it. We seek to serve compassionately and love. But then what I'll do is because the Lord gave me a picture there, I'm now going to pray for Larry until Larry leaves my mind. Every time Larry comes to mind, I'll see that as the spirit prompting me to pray for him, right? And I think that's also one of the things that, that the, the Lord does. We don't have to be burdened to just pray for anyone. As they come to mind, we take it as a prompting from the Holy Spirit. So we take these natural things and we begin to allow the spirit to uh, speak to us through them and in them. So 
It took us a little longer in teaching as I am often want to do. Uh, <laughs> but uh, maybe there's just for some of you something that particularly connected with you or moved you, or there might be a question that it stirred. Maybe you put it in the chat uh, there. Let me just turn it over to you, Brian, and let's, let's go through a few things here. <laughs> it's a preview of tomorrow's message, but please don't skip. <laughs> and it'd be Indeed. good what he says. <laughs> uh, uh, so I'm going to turn the uh, recording off now.